buttoned that up. <laughs> I'm very relaxed, as you can tell. Good stretching. Uh, g'day, guys, and uh, g'day to Dan Pronk, or Dr. Dan Pronk, should I say, mate. Um, before we start uh, getting sidetracked and getting into what is going to be an amazing episode and 90 minutes probably isn't going to cut it, um, could you just take us through, I suppose, your early life and, and your career in the Army and then what, what's happened sort of post and as a little snapshot um, and then we'll get into it, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Look, cheers for having me, guys. Anthony, Adrian, great to be on the show. The In a really quick nutshell, so born into an Army family. My dad was a, a helicopter pilot with the Army, and so he ended up going through the ranks and commanding an aviation regiment. So I grew up in an environment where I was familiar with Army. We were going to Army open days and bits and pieces uh, with hindsight back in the good old days where you could still get up in helicopters as the family and I remember shooting an M60, shooting blank when you know when I was maybe eight, nine years old. All the all the good stuff that I, I suspect they've uh, shut down now. But had one elder brother, so Ben, uh, my elder brother, who also was he was very uh, inclined towards the military from an early age. I wasn't. He was into his school cadets. He was pretty much streamlined straight into the Defence Force Academy RMC out of school. I took a different path out of school, so I finished up my high schooling. And ended up going to 10 different schools, wasn't particularly academic, but in my later years of school was got into sport. So I showed a little bit of promise as a middle distance runner and then a triathlete. And so pursued the triathlon thing for about five years and with the goal of, of hoping to make it as a professional athlete. Uh, that that failed miserably. I just <laughs> plain and simple wasn't good enough, but that took me from about age 18 to 23 at the same time, I was doing part-time uni. I did an exercise science degree on the Gold Coast. And so I'd finished up my exercise science. I gave triathlon one last ditch and it was clear I wasn't going to be the athlete that I had hoped to be. So I started looking at other options. And that was when the military first started to flag as a, a serious consideration on my radar. So I started to look at, at joining the army. Around the same time, I had sat the... Uh, what's called the GAMSAT exam, so the Graduate Australian Medical Schools Admission Test. So the, the test to, to get into postgraduate or apply for postgraduate uh, medical school. And I managed to get through GAMSAT and, uh, and had a score good enough to apply. Found out about the Army Scholarship Scheme that sponsors students through med school. And so those two came together and I, I joined up the Army to go off to med school. And so did my medicine. As I was going through that process, my brother had, he'd uh, gone through ad for RMC, done some time with an infantry battalion as a lieutenant. He went to two RAR and then uh, did SAS selection and went across to SASR. And, and so at the end of 2001, I'd finished my first year of med school. I was visiting uh, Ben over in Perth uh, before he was gearing up to go with an early push to Afghanistan. So that was, that was naturally pretty shortly after the September 11 attacks. And and it was at that point that I saw what the SAS regiment was all about and, and met a few of the people and decided that that was something that I'd like to potentially have a go at. So I finished up my medical school, did some a couple of years as a junior doctor, into the army, did some, some time doing all my courses to become an army doctor, to become deployable, and then had the opportunity to go and do SAS selection in 2008. And so that uh, managed to get myself through that and that led into special operations and served with the 2nd Commando Regiment and the SAS Regiment for the next five years. Got out in 2014, uh, did a Master of Business Administration when I got out and, and since then I've been working in a variety of roles. I've, um, I've helped run a small regional hospital up in Queensland for a bit. I ran the as the medical director, I ran the medical side of a, the state prison health service in South Australia. And then medically, more recently, I've been uh, working in an emergency department and, and doing a, a decent amount of, of stuff privately with a, a company called TACMED Australia, which is a, a veteran-owned company. It was founded by an ex-special uh, operations medic called Jeremy Holder. And I've, I've come on board as a co-owner in the last uh, five, six years. And so I work as the medical director, do some medical work with them. And then I've teamed up in the last couple of years with my brother, Ben, 
and uh, another ex SAS veteran, Tim Curtis, in a, 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 what's what we've called the the Resilient Shield, as a company there, and we've re released a book and and doing some work under that same name. So that pretty much is uh, is is me in a nutshell. I think that's that's us done. Yeah. All right. We'll just end it there then. That's great. No, <laughs> mate, uh, I, <laughs> um, and I suppose, I mean, I mean, this is fame, but I, I did a bit of background on you and, and checking out some of your stuff. And, and I mean, you're a little bit of a, a little bit famous, uh, in the circle, especially outside of the, even outside of the special operation circles, um, spoke with, uh, especially with Coco, um, one of our ambassadors, Coco yeah. McQuilty. Yep, yep. Um, he's like, you got to get Dan Pronk on because, especially some of the stuff around that, you know, the voodoo medics and, and that doing that, I suppose those experiences that then went on to shape your life and, mm. you know, how your reactions post that. Yeah, look, absolutely. The I think for a lot of us, and I've reflected a lot with people like Coco and, and the crew that were around military medicine and particularly at, the the crew that I was working closely with in the special operations and and that whole voodoo me medic community and at the time we we may not have fully appreciated what was going on because it was just the the task that was at hand and as you guys know you know you sign up you, to do a job and you go and do the job and it doesn't really seem extraordinary at the time but on reflection looking back it it really was a privileged time to be in that position when world events were were sort of falling as they were and and so yeah it was it was just unbelievable it was a window that opened and we had that opportunity to get over and uh to afghanistan and get involved in combat operations and and experience all those really rich experiences both positive and negative and and that window has subsequently closed and who knows if or when it will open again for medics to go and get that kind of exposure to pre-hospital blast gunshot wounds in a war zone. So it was it was a really privileged time. I was at the right place uh, in the right positions uh, with the right people to to experience that. And it's, yeah, it's not lost on me that that was a, a unique opportunity. Yeah, so for the people who, who um, because we've got some pretty avid civvies that have never been in the army. Um, uh, so you guys were in charge, like the medics, you were embedded with uh, special forces units and teams and were – effectively not it wasn't world war Two. You, you know had a red cross on and you didn't get shot at and you didn't shoot people it was you were effectively i mean could you explain it a little bit yeah for sure and this is a question that comes up a little bit and it's a logical one with the geneva convention and the the red cross and the the privileges afforded to medical personnel if they display that insignia uh, then other signatories to the Geneva Convention shouldn't shoot at them and they have different rules of engagement and it's it's a bit of a gentleman's agreement between warring parties. The With with special operations, we were employed in a, in a manner that was called a non-declared medical asset. And so basically we wore no insignia of being medical, not that I suspect it would have done anything other than draw fire, to be honest, uh, given that... The, <laughs> To the best of my knowledge, the <laughs> Taliban are not signatories to the uh, Geneva Convention. So, it, um, so we, yeah, we were undeclared. We were on the ground, uh, indistinguishable largely from any other uh, member of our teams. But uh, so that that afforded us the same rules of engagement. But it also it also meant that we were targetable as per any other uh, operator on the ground there. But. Certainly, we, we were not employed as an operator. We were there. We needed to be close enough to the point of injury to try and make a meaningful difference. So you had to be close to the action. But, you know, we were never, ideally, never the, the first ones through the door. Uh, that was for sure. But, yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't your textbook like you see in the movies, the medic doesn't get shot at. Uh, the medic does get shot at and, and on occasions the medic uh, needed to shoot back. Um, is this an added level of complexity? Um... I know talking about you know unconscious competence and, and all this sort of stuff, but when you when you're talking about you're in a gunfight, that's stressful enough, and then you're a medic, and I know they would have gone through some pretty big lead up training, um, but whereas if you're walking into a situation as a, a trained SAS operator, you know that you join the army to put your hand up to kick door, to do that sort of stuff, and then on the other side, if you're a, a medic, 
and then you're put in these positions and some pretty high stress stuff and then you have other people's lives in your hand while getting shot at. I mean, is this something that would have added to the stresses or are these people sort of above and beyond? Well, I don't know that it's above and beyond. I, I, everyone who works with that environment, myself included, we went in with our eyes wide open and this was, we wanted this. This was something we had trained hard for, had pushed hard for and actively sought out. So, I mean, the it was by the time we ended up on the ground and potentially in a, a gunfight in a place like Afghanistan, there was a lot that had led up to that. It wasn't it wasn't at all, you know, people being chucked into the deep end and sink or swim type routine. There was a huge amount of lead up training, and and you know, from for myself, this was the, by the time I ended up in Afghanistan for the first time on special operations. That had been my goal for six, seven, eight years. I'd been pushing in that direction. So yeah, there was a lot of investment there. There was a lot of training. Special operations has got a, a quite remarkable, actually, medical training pipeline to prepare special forces medics and nurses and doctors for that environment and there is there are some incredible selfless individuals that uh, that drive that training there's cardiothoracic vascular surgeons anesthetists the list goes on and, and they give up their time to make sure that that we were empowered with those skill sets to be able to try and make a difference under those very complex environments and to be honest with you, I, I never at the time felt stressed. I never felt uh, scared or that I was out of my depth. I felt that I'd been adequately trained. Maybe there was a bit of naivety there and a bit of, um, I'm not sure, but but I felt, and, and of course, we were always surrounded by, you know, some, some very, very competent soldiers to do the gunfighting and, and secure the situation so you could get on and do your medical task. And and so, yeah, it's... Um, it, it was never something where we, we would, I felt anyway, chucked in outside, uh, out of our depth or ill-prepared for what we, or unaware of what we were getting ourselves into. No, I mean, um, you see, is there stuff, I mean, we talk about personality tests. I mean, this come up in, uh, you know, you, you, you go and do those personality tests online and it, it tells you if you're, um, you know, intuitive and, and, and that. And I do remember, and I don't want to give too much away so people go and actually read the books, um, but your personality test was not normally the the operator equivalent, was it? It was some slight differences. Is that something that you think would have affected any sort of outcomes? Look, yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, and I, I talked to this. I think in um, uh, average seventy kilo dickhead, if I'm remembering correctly, or, or maybe it comes into resilient shield. I'm not sure, but but um, yeah, you're right. I mean, in the lead up to doing. SAS selection, I'd, I'd um, looked at the psychological testing and screening that happens there and, and had a feel for what they were looking for, that, that the typical leadership uh, personality profile. And, and I was not it by a long shot. I was almost the exact opposite. I, I, it, it might sound odd to, to some listeners, but I'm actually strongly introverted, I, um, which it, I think... When people think of introversion, they think of these wallflowers, these sort of shy people that don't want to get up and speak publicly or or can't lead or these kind of things. But I like to think of introversion and I think as it applies to myself as introversion or extroversion as to how you restore your energy. I heard this described, I can't remember who by it might be Simon Sinek or, or one of those uh, type of, of people, but but I, I, gener I regenerate my energy by being alone and being quiet and being by myself, being in my workshop, tinkering for six, eight hours or, or uh, stomping around in a national park by myself and staying overnight. They're, these kind of activities are, are how I restore my energy, where an extrovert might seek out a, a social gathering and social interaction and, and all of those sort of things. They need people around them and that group dynamic to restore their energy and when you look at the overlay of, of what correlates most strongly with leadership, when you look at the population average, extroversion seems to be more associated with leadership than introversion. But there's, there's no absolutes. And, but, yeah, you're quite right. My personality profile certainly did not fit the textbook profile of a, a special operator or a, a leader of any description pretty much. No, see, I've always thought that, found that 
sort of perplexing in, in regard like coming out of the army you see guys who are massively extroverted and and probably not they don't have the eq to back up the leadership role that they have and they're just louder ship and they just they just fall short of of that ability to mentor lead and know how to i suppose get the best out of the people underneath them and and adapt their leadership styles um so it's super interesting um you know that comment i think you're exactly right and i don't think there is a textbook profile for a leader really i think the gone are the days where that was the understanding that you had to fit this criteria to lead and and you mentioned the emotional intelligence and and there's so many different facets to it isn't there i mean the the that that ability to to have that uh, um, emotional intelligence to be able to interact with others, to be able to motivate others, to be able to lead by example, and then to know different leadership styles and which one's applicable at what point and, and chop and change between them. A lot of, I think a lot of leaders will have one style of leadership. They'll have one style of conflict management and it'll work for them to a certain degree. But I think a, a more emotionally intelligent leader will have a whole host of different styles and the trick is then knowing which one to apply to what person at what stage to get the, the most out of them. No, I mean, you sort of spoke about um, this kind of what you use to, to recharge and um, I suppose the, the idea is we do like to give people a little bit of, little bit of an insight to human optimization and performance. What are some of the things in that regard extra that you do, especially post um, you know, dealing with some of the some of the events that happened. Um, I know that I did. I did hear that you know, in in your books, keto, jetic diet is is a thing for you, and ice baths. Um, is there one thing that you could say to somebody and go, if you can't do any of it, do this one thing? And I know it's a holistic model, but what's it was there one thing that that really had that catholic moment for you? Yeah, look, absolutely, and that was mindfulness meditation which if if um, someone had have told me 20 years ago that I'd be spruiking this I would have said no nah, you got the wrong guy you know I, I was that textbook young bulletproof bloke that I think we see a lot of in the warrior culture in the military police forces correctional environments emergency department type staff ambulance officers I think and and probably blokes are, are more likely to be that person but certainly there's very strong-willed uh, females, of course, that that will have that that mindset. And, you know, it's very protective to a degree, but the, the one thing that was an absolute game changer in my time transitioning when, like many of us, I'd, I'd struggled and, and a lot of my demons from service started to catch up with me at, at that point, the one thing that was a, an absolute game changer was starting to do some mindfulness meditation and actually learning to slow my brain, control my brain. And I came to it as a last resort when all of my maladaptive coping strategies weren't working, when it, when I realised I, I couldn't keep sort of running from things or trying to drown them with alcohol. And so it was a bit of a last resort and, and um, yeah, absolute game changer. And the, the literature supports this and also the as part of the resilient shield construct we've we've got a government research grant and so we're doing a body of research we've got a, a survey which uses all scientifically validated tools to to validate our uh, model of resilience that being the resilient shield and the different layers it, it breaks down into and and so we've validated that model but what we've also been able to do i think we're up around seven thousand responses at the moment so we're starting to get a really good body of data that's being interpreted by a PhD psychologist from the University of Western Australia. And, and the overwhelming uh, outcome of that is that the, the thing that moves the needle the most on resilience from our survey data across a huge spectrum of people is the mind layer. And within the mind layer is a, some form of mindfulness or a meditative practice. And so, you know, I know personally, I know anecdotally, I know from the literature and we know from our survey that if you have 10 minutes to give, you know, once every two days, that's where the best bang for your buck is. What do you, um, how, how do you find user uptake with young men? 
to get them into mindfulness and meditation. I mean, it, it's something that we were, were very kind of passionate about. I've done a lot of breath work myself. It's amazing. But I know even with me, someone who I look in the mirror and I'm like, I, I understand what I need to do to structure a holistically healthy life. I know that mindfulness, I agree with you, that that, that is the one thing that if I don't do that, I mean, if, if I'm going to do one thing every day, it's do some breath work and it, it definitely gets rid of my anxiety. But it's always the last thing I feel like doing, ever. Um, the only time I ever sit down and I'm like, oh, I, really, I could really go with some, some breath work and meditation right now is before I'm about to do something that I know is going to make me nervous, like where we just I just came from, like giving speeches and stuff like that. I, I deliberately add an extra five minutes to, to my timing so I can do some breath work. But trying to do it every day, it's it's a hard habit to find fun in. Yeah. Well, have you got any recommendations for people? Oh, yeah, look, I mean, it's tough. And I think the other thing that's tough is trying to make it relevant to the warrior culture because I, I think a lot of people, I think particularly meditation, suffers from terrible PR. Like it is, it's stigmatised with being associated with a, a, a hippie, passive counterculture and and somewhere along the line we've lost this link between warriors and mindfulness and and if you if you change the if you're having that discussion and you start to talk about the samurai as a culture or the shaolin monks and and people start to say well yeah they you know that that they practiced a lot of mindfulness a lot of meditation and then they unleash absolute violence when it's when it's required and and you know that i think opens the discussion it's i'm like you i'm I'm no different. It's my habitual practices that are that are pretty much non-negotiable day in day out aren't fun ones. They're, they're things like cold showers. They're things like the the mindfulness. I, I try and get a bit of yoga in each day to just unknot my um, my middle aged man body that never stretches. Uh, so yeah, I think the it ways around that a try and make them relevant so if you can see the relevance people are much more likely to engage i know that you you can see the relevance in that mindfulness but then the that just that putting it in your day at a set time so making it habitual so that it's it's something you must do and and i tend to try and build it into my morning so i'll i'll get up and and then first thing i'll do even if it's only 10 15 minutes of of mindfulness meditation do that once again if it's only 10 15 minutes of yoga do that blast myself with a cold shower and then it's only 40 minutes out of your morning and i've ticked three boxes for that day and and it puts me in the right frame of mind so i, I think that that habit formation and that having set time each day when possible not beating yourself up if you fall out of the routine just and that comes into the whole mindfulness meditation piece that non-judgment just accepting yeah well the day got in the road or you know, the uh, day, day got away from me or things got in the road or different priorities and then just when you can, falling back into the routine. But um, I, I've found over time that I I can feel when my brain is overstimulated and I, I know well enough now that I can reset that and I can I can bring my brain down to a, a um, just make it feel a lot better basically calm it down through meditation so i know that the the juice is worth the squeeze and that helps me allocate time for it yeah i think i think there's some great crossover in what you said around um samurais and, and ninjas like eastern culture versus western culture is is i think the biggest problem that we're facing at the moment we need to get young veterans and soldiers more aligned with eastern culture than we are with the the western american chew bubble gum take no shit, carry six shooters. That's the kind of mentality that we all want. But I think I, I find that is the link as well to things like I, I have no dramas getting up and getting excited about a cold shower because there is an ego element to it. There, there's that part of that Western kind of culture. Like if I can do it and other people can't, it boosts my ego. Whereas sitting down and doing breath work, you can't flex that. You can't, there's nothing sexy about it and it's very Eastern. So I don't know. I, I, I think there is a lot of the Eastern culture it, they're the things that we as Westerners don't enjoy doing as much, but we know are so good for us. We've got to find, we, we're still battling with it. We've got to find a way to make that kind of stuff sexy or appealing to young blokes because young guys can definitely, definitely benefit from it. And, and like you said, I, I, we're all the same. Um, 20 years ago, we were different people. It was all Western, I'm six foot tall, bulletproof, and I'm going to be a superhero. Whereas now, I, I mean, I'm a massive introvert as well. I am happy to sit in the corner in the shadows, not doing anything, 
not not cool. That's how I recharge. But yeah, I, I think we need to find better ways to get younger younger males, especially, more excited about some Eastern health practices. Yeah, look, agreed completely. A lot of the stuff you you guys spoke in your book, um, and I don't want to give the game away too much, but that imposter syndrome um, and and knowing that you're putting yourself out there, that these things that you're saying, like you know, Swiss Eight and and the Resilience Shield, and these things work for anyone that's trying to do this sort of stuff and, and just using the instructor credibility, like when we started doing um, combat shooting in the army and we got a couple of guys from over West and did the road show and, and, and they started doing the road show because if I got up as a, as an infantry sergeant and said, Hey guys, this is how you combat shoot. Everyone's like, yeah, fuck off mate. Like I don't care. And then you get, you know, some of the legends from the West doing the road show and they're like, guys do this. They would fucking hang off every word they said. Uh, and that instructor credibility was so important. And and that combat breathing thing that they snuck in, um, which is box breathing. Yeah. Uh, and everyone's cool with that because you put a combat in front of it and they're like, fuck yeah, I'll combat breathe the shit out of it. Meditate. Nah, I'm not doing that. Like say, nearly the same thing, bro. Yeah, you know, a little bit. I mean, I know drawing your concentration to a point, but yeah. It, you're exactly right. And I've witnessed this and, you know, we do talk about imposter syndrome uh, in the resilient shield and it's it's something that certainly Ben Tim and I all encounter it's it's kind of like we've we've got this um this platform that that we as individuals you know at times think well gee there's this perception of who I am versus who I am and there's a bit of a a delta in between the two but the as you say I, I guess whatever engages an audience and and we're it's it's not lost on us that this I use the word privileged a lot because that's how I feel. It's a privileged position to be in, and if we can engage audiences and get messages through to them, uh, and if that if that relates to them because they perceive that we can speak with authority because of whatever we might have done in the past, then then that's great. And exactly as you said, and I experienced this within the. SAS, if you are part of an organisation, we could we could teach our patrol medics and scream at them until they're blue in the face about a certain thing, and if and they'd say yeah whatever you know because they're familiar with you and you you know you're one of you you one of that construct, but you bring in an external expert to say the exact same thing, and all of a sudden there's credibility. So you know someone comes from one of the US. Um, yeah, special mission units or whatever and says, hey, you know, we do this. They'll be like, oh, that's awesome. Let's do that. And you'd be like, I've been trying to tell you that for, for years. But however you get that message through and, and I think when people are ready to hear it and when it's packaged in the right format and, you know, we, we were talking before we uh, hit record here that Swiss 8 Resilient Shield are, are saying a lot of the same things. There's a lot of parallels there, absolutely, and it's it's just pushing that out and different people will find what resonates with them at the right time for them. And, uh, yeah, if we can all keep making the, the, the right noises, hopefully they'll resonate soon. Hopefully I can talk to find someone from 20 years. I mean, ours is that proactive, proactive. Yep. Um, and you guys, I mean, that's what we've been doing from the start. And you guys are the same, you know, like try and build your shield before you need it because it's super, it's super hard to, to get back on track. Yeah, um, yeah I just – Absolutely resonated with it, mate. I think I think the massive positive is that there is more organisations. I'm not sure how you came about this kind of information, but we, I mean, it's, it's lived experience and, and living through it and identifying there's some tools here that are a counter narrative to to what is mainstream medical practice. And I think the more organisations that pop up that are that are preaching the same thing, the better, because we're not we're not up against each other. We're up against big pharma and big health that are preaching to people. Don't worry about preventative. Just get sick, and then we'll solve your problem. And that—that that is, that's a toxic and a quick way to, to get unhealthy and, and die. So I, I think the more people that are out there screaming from the rooftops, this kind of stuff that you need to do breath work and you need to have ice baths and eating less carbohydrates is probably a good thing for your mental state. I, I think that's that's all for the better. Um, I mean, look look at like Wim Hof, and oh, I don't know if you follow uh, Mark Sisson. Mark sisson has been preaching this kind of stuff for over a decade. And it's, it, well, probably two decades now. And it took him about a decade to, to start getting momentum. And then we saw the, the paleo kind of movement explosion that went up, down, up, down. But 
this stuff's we in, in order to, to have a win in this space, we, we really do need to rewrite the current mental or and physical healthcare system. And it, it's not about small organizations against each other, it's about trying to make this stuff mainstream. I think we might be about a decade away from it even getting close, but it's it's good to see more and more people preaching it. Yeah, look, I couldn't agree more. Just coming off, I mean, this is one of the points I wanted to chat to you about. Is this coming off the back of now, and I don't know, um, but my missus is a big fan of the show, SAS Australia. I thought I saw your face as the doctor. Yeah, correct. So that the company I mentioned earlier, TACMED Australia, has had the contracts for medical support for that filming for the last uh, three seasons now. And so, yep, absolutely, that's, that would have been me. Sorry about that. And, uh, yeah, I've just, just come off the, the season four they've just uh, recorded in an undisclosed locality in New South Wales. What's the inside scoop, mate? Who's the winner? Oh, I think there's some wording in my contract. I didn't read it closely, but I'm pretty sure I'm not meant to talk about that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there stuff that, um, I mean, you know, not getting you in trouble, but when you when you see some of these, and I think it's, it was really cool to see some of these people going in, and I know it's not as hard as the course, and I know the activities, some of them are quite benign, but seeing the mental toll on these people, I mean, would would you – at points you're like, come on, mate, it's not that fucking hard. Like, and then are some of the activities at, some of them look actually pretty demanding. Yeah. Look, I would challenge that, that argument that it's not as tough as the real course The I think when, and we talk about this, when we look at resilience and stress, they are relative to the individual. They shouldn't be looked at as absolutes. And, and this is, you know, I use the example of a, a, I've done a number of presentations where I've presented, you know, a snapshot of my background and then and then tried to impart some lessons learned. And and the amount of times I've had people come up to me afterwards and, and open up with, oh, it's nothing compared to your experience. However, I had this. And I think that's that's got to change because it's not a it, trauma isn't a competition. Stress isn't a competition. It's it's relative to your resilience to that stress. And for me, I mentioned earlier, I, I never felt particularly stressed in the combat environment or in the combat casualty environment because I was trained in that. I, I'd, I'd had a lot of time and energy invested in me to be resilient to those stressors and yet chuck me up on stage in Australia's Got Talent and I'm going to be panicked, you know, because I've got nothing. I'm no, you know, voice or whatever, you know, put me in an environment where, that is that I don't have resilience against. So I'm going to be terrified. And, and so what, a good example of that was a like a bank teller who who came up and said, you know, nothing compared to you. However, I once had a knife held to my throat in a, a bank um, uh, hold up and and had understandably had post traumatic stress. And and you know, someone pulling a knife on a, a trained special forces soldier that's probably not that confronting. But for someone who's not been trained to be resilient to that, that's hugely confronting. And and they thought their life was at risk and. And, and understandably had post-traumatic complications of that. And so, I mean, bringing that back to SAS Australia, the TV show, it's, it, it's not designed to be a selection course. There is no unit that they go on to. However, it does, for, for these people coming from their backgrounds, it, it uh, in my opinion, is akin to a trained soldier going and doing SAS selection because the relative stress of that compared to the resilience they have against that stress is probably pretty equal to a trained soldier going onto a real special unit selection course. And it's, it is a, a properly stressful course. They, they create all the same atmosphere, that uncertainty. You never know when one of the DS is going to burst in at 2am and kick you out and, and PT you till your bloody ears bleed and then chuck you in an ice bath. And, you know, they don't know. So their stress response, their stress hormones would be pumping over time. The, uh, a lot of the things they get them to do that look like stunts to us are very confronting for some of these people. You know, to people like us, it might look like great fun or it might look quite easy if you've been in the military climbing a caving ladder or jumping out of a helicopter or whatever. It might just look like fun. But for people who have never have never been in a helicopter, some of them, the thought of jumping out of that thing from 10 metres up when they may not be a strong swimmer into the water and then swimming ashore, these are, these are hugely stressful uh, environments to place them in and then some of the PT sessions among the um, course 
would well and truly parallel those on the the real selection courses. I can tell you that straight up, they are brutal. So yeah, look, I I think uh, it's not apples and apples, but I think it is akin. I, I take my hat off to anyone who signs up for these shows. It is a proper stressful environment, and it it wears them down. The ones that stick around long enough to the exact same point that you'll end up wearing down a candidate on a, a, a proper military special unit selection course. And that is where they're absolutely physically flogged. They're sleep deprived, they're food deprived, they've lost weight. They are just functioning purely on psychological resilience and, and they reach that point. You see it. And I think it's remarkable that these people, some of them get to the end of these courses. Mate, I, uh, I've been watching it and, and just some of them, have you, have you gone with some of them that would go to hand in their, their numbers? You're like, don't do it, mate. Like, I've, I've got chips on you. Keep going. Yeah, it's hard to watch sometimes. And it's it's tough to to see some of them uh, when you know that they and, – and also, I guess, being behind the scenes, you've got some insight into what's coming and you might know that, that the session's going to end in, in five minutes, but they don't know that. For all they know, they're going to be lugging – you know, 200 kilos worth of tyres for the next six hours. They've got no idea, which once again is the, the whole design. But, yeah, it is. It's it's tough to watch sometimes. But I think that – and the DS are very good in that regard and and a lot of the time they, they don't just snatch the numbers straight off them. They'll say, hey, look, why don't you stop and think about that when they can clearly see that the recruit is doing something impulsive because things are going horribly wrong or they're exhausted or they're cold or they're – tired or hungry or whatever else, they'll give them the, the chance to, to put it back on, just let the dust settle and, and uh, crack on. But, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, it is it is hard as the dock to sometimes uh, maintain that that kind of almost callous, uh, not much empathy type interaction with them when all you want to do is, is just give them a hug and say, man, you're doing awesome. Just hang in there. You, you, you've got no idea. You're doing great. Yeah, because you, you were the uh... – SAS doctor for what five years? You have been intimately involved in the uh, selection courses. Yeah, that's right. So I spent five years between the Second Commando Regiment and the SAS Regiment. So I, I served with both, but had the opportunity to be the doctor on selection uh, quite a number of times. And and so yeah, I've I've se- seen that from the perspective those courses from the perspective of a, a candidate on it and know what that feels like. And then a doctor supporting it, and know what that looks like. And then this is just a a great continuation of that in a in a very different environment for the TV show, but a lot of the same underpinning principles. And it's all very very interesting. No, we, we my brother reached out to uh, Aunt Middleton just off the bat and was like, "Hey, um, these Swiss Eight Boys do a do you want to jump on the podcast?" He's like, "Yeah, let's go for it." So we're in we're in negotiations now. When he's free, we're going to get him on and and rack his brain about it. It's going to be great. Yeah, awesome stuff. Mate, I was going to ask, um, as, as someone who's served in both 2 Commando and then SASR, um, is it the pissing contest that we were taught as, as young blokes in the battalions that, that the two units hate each other? Or is that all just fluff and, and the boys actually get along? Oh, look, it's... I think that in those sort of environments, in the military in general, you, you've got a lot of social identity theory at play. You, you get formed into groups and then subgroups and then sub-subgroups and, and you align yourself with them and you, you get a group identity. And, and part of that can be, well, part of that has to be, if you're part of an in-group, then by definition, there needs to be out-groups. There's got to be them. And, you know, I think when you join the military, you are all of a sudden distinguishing yourself as military as opposed to civilian. And so the civvies are all of a sudden this lesser being that is, uh, you know, doesn't understand and has no discipline and turns up 10 minutes late to everything. And, and which of course is ridiculous because all that does is creates problems when guess what? Everyone discharges and become, tries to become a civvy again. And if you've, you've spent your whole career looking down your nose at, at this group of people, then uh, guess what? It's difficult to be one, but the, so I think, and then you, you know, maybe you go army, and then you're you're then different to navy and air force, and and you tend to build that esprit de corps that you're the superior service for whatever reason, and they're doing exactly the same thing, and then you'll go to a unit, and and then a subunit, and and it goes on. So so I guess there's a degree of of that unit identity 
the naturally the SAS regiment has has been around a lot longer than 4 RAR slash Second Commando Regiment, and so there was probably some of the old and bolds that might have, have felt that that you know this new unit needed to earn its stripes, which I think you know it's undeniable that that 4 RAR slash Two Commando has has done that in spades, and then maybe there might have been some in either group that that had that toxic rivalry. It's, I had a pretty lucky position in that I, I, I moved between the two units and, and then when I was deployed with the Special Operations Task Group, I sat at a um, task group level asset so I could just get plugged and played into either element if they needed the, the higher level medical support. So I never it required to, to buy into any of that inter unit rivalry. Um, but, yeah, look, I, I suspect it, it was there. But it's it's hard to know whether it existed to the degree that it gets played out in the media or if that gets hammed up. But uh, and and I can't speak for how it's been uh, in the last six seven years since I've been out. I haven't had much contact. But but I, I do know that a lot of Second Commando Regiment members uh, did SA selection and moved across, and hopefully that'll start to break down any of those barriers that might have existed when when. Uh, you know, these people have seen both units and understand that both are fantastic capabilities. Mate, I, I love the, the identity piece that you touched on. I couldn't agree more. You make training soldiers when they first join the military to, to believe that all civvies are slow and lazy. And, and the identity piece is, is massive um, because for most most young soldiers in the regular army, it's, that's a false statement anyway because they're also always <laughs> lazy and lazy. But um, on the, on the identity piece is is one of the top four. When we, we did a bunch of surveys when we were first building the Swiss app, and that was one of, I think, the, the was either number one or number two. Um, loss of identity was the leading cause of mental health decline post-service. And I, I hate to do it. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I, I tie that back to the East versus Western culture as well. Um, there, was a, there was a story, I'm going to butcher the shit out of this, but there was a story I, I heard about sitting a young American kid down to look at an old class photo and a young Japanese kid down to look at an old class photo and asking them if, I hope you're not shaking your head because you've heard this story because the one that I'm about to recite is probably not even anywhere close to the one that I'm supposed to be telling. But um, they, they sit down and they're like, can you remember, was this a good day or a bad day? And and the American kid um, looks at the photo and it's like, oh, that wasn't the best day because this happened to me and I wasn't looking good. I don't look good enough in the photo and, and this happened to me on that day. And the, the Japanese kid looks at the photo and goes, it was a good day because all of my classmates are smiling. And, and it straight away goes to like Western identity is focused on us, whereas Eastern identity is focused on their community. And I think that, again, is a, is a massive problem, um, with, especially in veterans transitioning, like you said. It's like all, the identity piece is focused on who am I, who am I, what, what am I, what are other people perceive me as, uh, whereas we could be moving towards an Eastern identity culture where like, is this country still a good country? Other people around me still great people? Yes, then it's a pretty good life. So I don't know. I'll, I'll probably still keep linking back to East versus West all night, but I, I think the, the bit that you touched on with the identity piece is massive because the first thing you do when you join the military is you identify as your unit and then you identify as your subunit and everybody else is beneath you or, or so we're taught. Yeah, look, I, I think you're exactly right there, Adrian, and a, a massive part of that transition and, I've had a good look at this and really actually my my rocky transition was what led to the, the my interest in resilience and then what sparked the whole resilient shield project uh, as as I tried to negotiate that and and a huge part of it for me was loss of identity it was uh, what's known as contingent self esteem so I felt good about myself when I was in the military and I I, I felt that I was functioning well as a doctor with the army and other people were, I was getting externally validated as well. You know, here's a pat on the head, have a medal uh, type thing. And and so it was all bolstering this self-esteem, but it was all uh, linked to me being in that uniform. And as was all my professional satisfaction, my sense of self-worth, my access to the flow state, all the stuff that I found stimulating and engaging, my professional development was all uh, military medical professional development. And, and then when I got out, it was the loss of all of that and the, the fact that I had undergone uh, what's known as identity fusion. I basically didn't know who I was outside of my military role. And so all of a sudden I got out, I'm, I'm 
dislocated from my tribe, you know, all the people that I'd had these really rich experiences with and and were my people who understood me and, and were culturally aligned were, were all the, the medics that I'd worked with. And, and uh, all of a sudden I, I get out, I move away from that, you lose your tribe, I lost my identity, lost my purpose, and, and then you, you fall in a bit of a heap. And, and they're starting to talk about this concept of transition stress, which I like because I think for too long probably what is transition stress has been stamped as post-traumatic stress disorder and which I, I see why that happens. I, I get it. And the, the two are interwoven and certainly in my own experience on reflection, what I feel happened was I, I suffered from all that loss of identity, loss of purpose, uh, dislocation from my tribe, all these factors that I now know were bolstering my resilience. There was still a ton of stress and cumulative trauma there that I'd never thought I needed to process and all of a sudden this drop in resilience left me vulnerable to all of that stuff and it caught up with me and so that I think was predominantly a period of transition stress that left me vulnerable to a degree of post-traumatic stress and uh, there's no question I had symptoms of uh, post-traumatic stress and and yeah it's a, it's a very interesting beast but it's a tough one in that I think if we don't indoctrinate soldiers and we don't form that, that esprit de corps and that group, that social identity theory isn't at play, then they're not going to be invested enough to go and do what they need to do. But um, there needs to be, I think, some counterbalance to that. And, and if it's, I think there's ways of bolstering a group identity that aren't toxic and derogatory towards an out group. And I think that's, that's a, a good leader will do that. Yeah, mate, I agree. Have, have you ever come across a book, um, just talking about the tribe stuff, have you ever come across a book called Lost Connections? No, I've not. That sounds good. What, uh, what's that all about? Mate, oh, I mean, the, the, the whole book's about um, any anxieties, any depressants, and a young uh, British journalist wrote it, and he was pres prescribed this stuff as he was a teenager coming up. He was on it for, for most of his young adult life. Um, and then he started to break down what was actually causing him to be miserable because uh, at the time, all, all the data coming from pharmaceutical studies was that it was just a chemical imbalance in your brain. You take a pill, you fix the imbalance. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, what, what he, what the book basically uncovers is that the disconnection and isolation is what's causing a lot of people around the world at the moment to be extremely miserable, anxious and depressed. Uh, and, and he breaks down that the, all of these other things like addiction to alcohol and, and, and narcotics um, come from seeking an escape from their lonely, isolated life. So, so he starts to look at it, but he's saying that, that isolation and loneliness is, is the leading cause of all of his problems. But the big one around tribe um, that I kind of steal bits and pieces from his book to, to throw into talks when we give them is around um, tribal, warriors type tribal connection and, and what happens when you are disconnected from that tribe. And he looks back at uh, research from, from when we were kind of hunter gatherers and, and the anthropology and, and the, the human, the biology over time, we haven't changed from those people. And and back in the day when we were going out in a hunting party, we weren't apex predators. If we, if we come across a wolf or a lion or a croc or a hippo, or, or the list goes on, we're not going to win that fight unless we're with our tribe. So if this connection or if you got separated from your tribe while you're out hunting, your chances of survival are slim to none. And that's when we developed over time the, the sympathetic nervous system would initiate as soon as we got disconnected from our tribe. Uh, and now we live in cities, we're surrounded by mates all the time until we're not and we still have that biological response. And, I mean, I, I haven't done the research. I mean, I've done my own reading, but I haven't been in part of the news to do research on this. But all the signs and symptoms that we're seeing that are the, well, the anxiety and the depression signs and symptoms associated with loneliness, isolation and disconnection mirror post-traumatic stress. Um, and I know there is a lot of soldiers out there with, with acute PTSD and that's not, not what we're talking to here. But I, I'm concerned that we've over-diagnosed PTSD with a lot of military veterans when the signs and symptoms they were actually seeing were disconnection from tribe. And I think, I think this tribal thing is something that we need to be paying far more attention to because... We are, we are a bee stick away from being a monkey and, and we need our people, the people we trust and love, we need them around us to feel safe. And we have that in the military and then, then one day it turns off and we, we leave and it's all gone. 
I think I think that's a, a big part of the problem that it's not getting enough attention. Yeah, look, I, I tend to agree a hundred percent. And some of the research we did into the social layer of the resilient shield model looked at at loneliness and looked at the data behind it. And the US Surgeon General makes an interesting comment talking about loneliness and 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 talks about it being a, a, an epidemic, you know, this loneliness epidemic, which has been worsened by COVID and the disconnection of social isolation and and uh, the requirement to to stop the spread of COVID. But but he he likens loneliness to smoking fifteen cigarettes a day in terms of its detriment on your physical health and certainly the psychological health. And you're exactly right. I mean, we uh, we have evolved over. Uh, the bit since the beginning of, of the human species to be pack animals and exactly as you said that was a survival uh thing in the, in the initial instance and then it became you know it made sense to be part of a community and have complementing uh, skills and and resources as we went along and so we've evolved to be these social creatures and we we need a degree of that social interaction and and when you look at the the interesting overlap in the neurotransmitters or lack thereof, your dopamines, your serotonins, your oxytocins, uh, these these chemicals that regulate our moods and, and have a, a huge effect on our mental health and well-being, the ways you can stimulate those, I mean, sure, yeah, we can throw a pill at it, but that's not, when we look at a root cause analysis, you're not getting to the root cause there, you're chucking a Band-Aid over the, the top of it and and exactly as you said, this isn't to take anything away from those who have who have legitimately got post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety or depression. Uh, not at all. I mean, there's a role for pharmaceuticals and it's fantastic that we've got them. But I think likewise, there's also a role for this, this range of other interventions that we know uh, tinkers with those same neurotransmitters. And that is social interaction. That is mindfulness meditation. That is engaging in activities where you can tap into a flow state. You know, the, the list goes on. Petting your, your, your dog or your cat, we know, releases oxytocin that, that increases that, that bond, as does intimate, you know, social relationships or a, a, a present uh, interaction with another human being. And so, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating space. But, but whilst we spoke earlier about introversion and recharging your, your batteries by yourself, uh, you know, coming back to my example, and I think for a lot, it's something I heard recently on a, an audio book. I can't really remember what it was, but it was talking about human optimization and peak performance. And it was talking about needing a base to come back to, having a core that you can come back to where you can be centered. And that might be a family unit or close friends or, or what have you, but having that that tribe that you can project out of and push out and push the limits, but you always want to come back to that. And without that, you can you can be a bit lost and directionless, and it's hard to to perform optimally for, for long periods of time uh, if you don't have that core and that base that is that is rooted in social interaction. Yeah, mate, I, I 100% agree, and, and and from personal experience, like I am a, a massive introvert. I, I if I spend too much time with people, I need to just I'm, I'm glad because I've got, I've got a house in Sydney where I've got a, a house mate, and then I've got a house in Newcastle when I have the kids, but I go up there and I don't have the kids. I've got the house myself. And there's weeks where I'm like, I just need to get to Newcastle and sit in. So I'll, I'll just be at home by myself away from people. But then I get to the point where I need to learn what my ratio is. Because if I spend too much time by myself, then I start getting miserable as well. And I think I think that's a big lesson that um, a, a lot of young people need to learn as well. Is like, what is your ratio of, of people to, to isolation? Because everyone's different and... I know if I, I haven't worked out my exact balance yet, but too much time with people drives me mental. Too much time alone, and then you start to getting depressed. There's, there's got to be a happy medium in there somewhere for everyone. The other thing there is differentiating loneliness from solitude, and so solitude is seeking out being alone for 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 anyone, but to to have some quiet time, to be able to have some mindful time, to be able to reflect. For the introverts to regenerate their energy so solitude is not loneliness that is that is seeking out being alone for those purposes but like you say if that stretches out too long that can start to tip into loneliness and you need some some human engagement and i think everyone is different and i'd also uh, propose that 
that it's not a static construct. I don't think there will be one ratio for you that says 60% to 40% or whatever. It's going to be dynamic, like we know resilience is, like we know stress is. It's going to change over time. It's going to change over your lifetime, over your age and stage, your, your social circumstance, whether you've got kids, whether you don't, these kind of things. So, yeah, I think it's a dynamic construct and it's it's something that, that needs to be forever fine-tuned. Mate, um, yeah, there's some pretty outstanding uh, comments and, and people are going to fucking love this episode, absolutely. What is the one thing that you think stops people so we've, they've got all this information, right? They've got, you know, you, you've got the ability to do any, the phone in your hand, you can learn and literally do anything with. There's no difference, but we've really leveled the field when it comes to success and perform. But what is the thing that stops people reaching their goals or even trying to start? We're all capable of it, but it just seems like the difference between some people and, and other people is that, in my opinion, we've lost the power of decision and making a fucking decision to go and do something. Um, what's your sort of opinion or, or advice for people if they're trying to start that down that pathway or they don't know where to start? I think probably the biggest thing is it's too easy not to these days. It is so easy and so tempting to have a comfortable existence and, and just to – sit on social media and Netflix and, and just not have to use your brain or push out of that comfort zone. And I think we see these exceptional performances on little snippets of social media, curated, you know, social media posts that, that look excellent. We think, geez, I'd love to do that. But what gets lost is that 10,000 hours that leads up to that excellence. And, and then it comes back to there's probably everyone has, has things that they'd love to do in their life, but the, the reality of it is it's fucking hard. It's hard to excel. Uh, but I, I would argue that it's it's possibly never been easier because life is so comfortable and there's so many other distractions. There's probably the field of, of people that are, are looking to excel. I don't know. I'm basing this on absolutely nothing. But but I, I guess, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there was, there was none of – none of the stuff we've got today. There was no internet. There was no – people were out playing sports. So it was probably – we were more physical. We were out climbing trees. We were out playing footy. We were out doing this, that, and the other because we, we wanted to entertain ourselves. We didn't have the options. Now we've got options. And so it's actually an effort to get out there and, and you've got to force yourself to leave your phone at home to go and do something without a distraction. So, But, but at the end of the day, it's very hard. Maybe people don't – have never – had cause to learn about a goal setting process and, and things like smart goals where you, you set a long-term goal, but break it down into smaller, attainable, measurable, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and then it, it, it also comes down to self-discipline, which is once again, it's hard. It is hard. It's so easy to get distracted and, um, and, and not move towards your goal or to start moving towards your goal in the initial instance, because you, you're keen and you're motivated and it's new and shiny but then two, three, four weeks, months, years, maybe even down the track, trying to maintain that grind towards this this goal and just that that always a little further, just trying to edge towards something that seems like it's a, a million years off is is fucking hard. <laughs> so I mean, it's and I suppose it's it's not it's not for everyone, and that's not to be dismissive of people who don't who don't um, aspire for lofty things. I, I think whatever whatever fits but but certainly the people there's a, a lot of people out there who do have these lost, lofty aspirations and, and I get contacted a lot about um, people who who might be in a medical school and want to want to be a doctor with special forces is something that people reach out to me and and there's no easy way to answer that it is just put in the yards you know through finish your medical school do your specialty training join the military pay your dues try and get a posting across to special forces if the opportunity presents and, and you're in a, a country that allows your doctor to go do selection, train for years, do selection. You know, I mean, there's there's no short answer. There's no shortcut. There's no social media one-minute snapshot to go from where you are to what you want to achieve. It's just set that goal and grind away at it, just force your way through setbacks and just keep going. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Can't even remember what you asked me, but I don't know if there's any silver bullet there. <laughs> but um, I, I think the the, the self belief 
Mate, that was just a good answer. I was just enjoying just the that story. On that one, um, do you ever think, like, when, because to get, to join the army, to become a doctor and then become a special forces doctor, I mean, I, I don't know the full story of how long it took, but did you ever get those questions from people and, and, and you hold back and you're like, I, I don't want to tell them the full story because that'll scare them away if the goal's too big? Do I tell them, start by joining the military and then get, come back to me in five years and I'll give you the next piece of the puzzle? Oh, look, I, I always try and be encouraging and the overwhelmingly I try and convey the fact that this is an achiev- achievable goal. Like, I did it, you know, and... Uh, the the whole sort of tongue in cheek title of that the, the book average seventy kilo dickhead is is there's a story behind that that I describe in the first chapter where that uh, phrase came from but it's it, it's something that describes me well I'm 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 pretty short I'm I'm not a big bloke and I'm a bit of a dickhead but the so I mean the, these goals are achievable for a start these and to be, I think groups like special operations or for, for some people looking at becoming a doctor, they, they seem like these unobtainable goals that are that are only for the the lucky few or the genetically gifted or the the whatever else you know the the huge intellects and but there's there's ways of achieving this and and it does just come back to that. So so I guess if I'm answering those questions, I like to say yes for a start, this is achievable. Uh, here are the the steps, and this is a goal that you need to. To set aside if they're you know if they're not in med school or they're coming out of high school or something like that I mean that's a that's a decade of your life that you've got to push in a very deliberate direction to potentially even be in the running to be in one of those roles and then there's no guarantee that you'll you'll get that role and so it, it, it and and then also just trying to paint a um, without dissuading them but to paint a holistic picture of what that job looks like and it is not all the you know, swinging out of helicopters and and patching up people in gunfights or putting tourniquets on or blown off limbs. That's that's the minutia of the role. Uh, and and you guys know this in the army. The people tend to to think that the the whole role is is exciting, high adrenaline, high energy. And and the reality of it is that's not the case. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of missed birthdays and Christmases. It's it's a, a lot of compromise and and a lot of on the bus, off the bus, or, you know, ramp up for something and it never happens. But so uh, I, I really try to uh, be as as candid and honest as I can, but all the while saying, you know, this is achievable. And if you feel this is your life calling, then do it. You know, do not die wondering. Don't find yourself aged 48 looking back thinking, I wonder if I could, you know, ha- have a go, dedicate yourself to it. You've got to be doing something with your time. So why not spend your time moving in a, a direction of a lost, lofty aspiration. Best case, you get there. Worst case, you've you've progressed and it'll lead you somewhere else. Mate, the the, the part about defence recruiting videos, mate. If, if false advertising was a chargeable offence in Australia, defence recruiting would be locked up for life. It was nothing. It was nothing like they told me it was going to be. <laughs> but on on that topic, it, um. Forgive me if this is an insulting question. Is it you or your brother that gets photos with all the drugs and money and, and a mohawk? Yeah, that's me. So we, 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 we the, 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 well, it's both of us. We're <laughs> getting all these questions. And there's, there's a photo that has done the rounds of um, a, a job that I, we're working with the uh, Drug Enforcement Ad, uh, Administration, the DEA in Afghanistan, their FAST team, so their paramilitary uh, division. So we were working with them and there's a, a photo that circulates a, a little bit. I've got a, a kilo of heroin in one hand and a, a wad of cash in the other hand. And so that one's me. There's uh, there's one of my brother that does the rounds where he's got a massive bag of weed and, and a, a big beard and, and uh, you know, all the, all the M4 and all the fruit hanging off it and all that. So, so it is both of us. We've both tried that look. Uh, the mohawk was me. Uh, that was a yeah, hairstyle that I ran for, for one rotation there. That um, that is is been vetoed by my wife more recently. But uh, yeah, so but both of us. So I reckon that's why you're getting all these phone calls, mate. People see that photo and they're like, "I want to do that for a living," and then they're like, "What? Well, I don't even know what that job is." And it's like, "Oh, it's an SF doctor." It's like, "Oh, sweet, that's what I need to do." So, oh, you got to go to uni for ten years and then. Past SFs, oh, no, 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 I'm just, I just want to be that dude in the photo. That's what the young blokes are thinking. 
Look, and I was no different when in the lead up when I was looking at special forces from the outside. I wanted to be that guy in the photo. There was a there was a huge amount of extrinsic motivation, but also equally a huge amount of of intrinsic motivation to try and be the best version of myself I could be. And once I was in that med school pipeline, and and then had my eyes opened to the fact um, that the SAS regiment had a doctor, I'm like, wow, okay, let's uh, let's have a go at that. But which I think's important, and it's it's. I think it's normal. It's human nature. The the interesting part about that photo with the, the heroin and the cash and we're burning it all in a pile behind me is it, people will look at that and, and see exactly what you're saying. You know, that looks cool. How do I get in on that? I, I look at that and, and what I see is is what happened about an hour after that photo or less than, and that was uh, one of our combat engineers, Rowan Robinson, was uh, shot in the neck and the the... The, the blokes that responded to him under really dire circumstances did a, a fantastic job of the initial management. I got to him shortly after and very desperate. Um, we, we had a, it was actually a US State Department helicopter providing fire support above us and it was the closest air asset. And uh, so we brought it in, chucked him on, I hopped on and, and frantically tried to, to uh, work on Ryan, but sadly we lost him that day. So it's, it's funny that photo holds a very different meaning to, to me, you know, it's um, it was a, a big day. Uh, earlier in the day, we'd had a DEA agent uh, shot as well and, and I responded to him and thankfully he did really well and made a full recovery. But, but yeah, what I see is what happened an hour after that. I think what most people see is, man, I want, I want in on that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it might be a bit of a careful what you wish for. Yeah, I think... Um... It's that in, it's Instagram life, isn't it? Where people see that you know person on a beach, you know, in a bikini, and they're like, "Oh, that's how she lives her life all the time." And they're like, "Oh, SF, they just go and kick doors, and there's zero consequences to the life they've chosen to live or the lead up that it took them to get there, uh, and the failures that they they kind of have to do along the way." Yeah, you're exactly right, and. I, I must apologise. I'm I'm guilty of, of probably perpetuating that image. The and it, it but it it does get engagement. It's it's something that I see as a, a tool to to try and and get attention, and then hopefully steer that attention if I can to towards the direction of you know let's talk about resilience. Let's talk about mental health. Yes, this this is what I used to do. This is what we used to do. Here's how you get to do it if you want to do that, but beware, here are the consequences of choosing that path from a, a physical and a, a psychological perspective. And it, it exactly as you just said, uh, you know, Anthony, it's not it is not all the the door kicking and and, and in the, the 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 medical crew that I interact with or the med students or the medics, it's it's not all patching up, you know, gunshot wounds and, and blast injuries. That's that's the minutiae. Uh, but there's there's a whole bunch behind that. It's still very professionally rewarding, but it comes at a cost. And so yeah, look, you're right. But I mean, social media, I think, is has got a lot to answer for with regards to that. But used as a as a hook to get attention, and then hopefully move people in a direction that might uh, give them some tools to better negotiate their life. You know, I think it's it's useful. Yeah, that photo is absolute. It honestly is, mate. It it it. It epitomized, and it's a ju- such a, a stark juxtaposition between a doctor, and then and how you think, and all your you know prejudices, and what you think a doctor is supposed to be, and then you see this mohawked, bearded gunfighter, completely the opposite, and you're going, you know, and then they're like, wow, that's pretty cool, and you you know you got the hook out there, you got the bait, and then you're like, hey, while you're here, how about you check out some of this stuff? It's pretty cool, you know what I mean? Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't look much like what the average person would would stereotypically think of as a doctor. But I think it's good to challenge that stereotype as well, you know. And and I, I've certainly got a lot of work colleagues that that have got all sorts of crazy hair, dreadlocks, you know, earrings, nose rings, and and they are exponentially better doctors than I am. And so I think it's good to to challenge those stereotypes. But um, yeah, I think it is a little bit hard for some to reconcile the a doctor with a M4 slung around their uh, neck and body armor and whatever else. But um, to, to be honest with you, I, I often look at those images now and 
look at helmet camera footage that, that I might have captured back in the day and, and it doesn't really even seem like me, to be honest. I feel like I've evolved and, and moved on and and that that one image, that drug one, was that's a decade ago now and, and so a lot, lot of water under the bridge. I'm a different person to who I was then. I'm, I'm very proud of my service and glad that, that I've done it but, but there's been a lot of evolution and change since then and it almost looks like a different person or like, you know, a movie that I watched, uh, some of it. This is going to be like seven questions crammed into one, but the the main thing I'm trying to get to is: Do you think it would make all Australian doctors better at their job if they did some time in the military? And I'll, I'll prefix that with context. I personal belief: I joined the military like a young kid that ego driven, Western culture wanted to be big, bad, and bulletproof. Um, there was sense of purpose in, in in kind of service to country and all that good stuff as well. Um, and then when I was younger, I, I loved the idea of training to go to war because that is the romantic idea of, of young boys that have been doing it for, for generations, going to fight war to prove themselves as men. I'm po- completely polar, uh, opposite or contrasting opinions about life at the moment, and, and I don't like propaganda and, and brainwashing young men to go and fight people who may or may not be good or bad, getting slightly off topic. At the same time, I've got two young boys, three and four years old. I would love to see them grow up and, and spend at least a couple of years in the military because I think it's great discipline, make great mates. Um, so going back to the original question, do, do you see value? I mean, I, I understand now that we're not in the Middle East anymore. You're not going to get as much hands-on kind of experience with, with gunshot wound, with blast injury. But the value for young doctors, would, would it be a... a, a promising model to pitch it to to have all young doctors do some form of reserve or, or full-time military experience i really don't think it would add any value if i'm being brutally honest based on my experience as a, a doctor with the army the for, for people that are that way inclined the it's a great career and you know there's some there's some fantastic military doctors uh, i spoke about some of them earlier the crew that set up our training pipeline to get us ready for our roles. And I thoroughly enjoyed my time with Defence. I worked with some some brilliant uh, doctors that have stayed in and progressed through the ranks. But the reality of medicine in the military is it's it's very limiting what you see and what you do. And, and just by nature of the military being what it is, you, no one who's sick or who, who's old or who's young gets into the military. It's, it's, it's healthy people of a certain age, if you get sick while you're in or too broken, you get you get uh, kicked out. And so, I mean, from a medical perspective, there's a there's a real degradation in your um, in your. Does, does that describe you? <laughs> the, 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 but but certainly, there's a real. It, it's a challenge to maintain your professional uh, competence. We we had a lot of upskilling in special operations in a very specific niche of tactical medicine, which has no real wider applicability when you go back to being a civilian doctor. So look, and from a, a discipline perspective, doctors in the army being specialist service officers as they are, you, you don't get that same military training. You get um, you, you get a really abbreviated officer training, which I thoroughly enjoyed and it was great. But And then when you, when you get a rank, of course, that gets uh, almost thrown at you inappropriately just because you have to hold rank to to do your function as a doctor and to get a seat at the grown-ups table and all the rest of it. But it's not like someone like my brother who, who earned his rank through the, through the various levels and ended up, well, commanding the SAS regiment. You know, if you look at him as a lieutenant colonel as the boss of SASR versus a lieutenant colonel medical officer who's gone through their training, the, it's, I don't feel it's comparing apples and apples and I don't feel they, they would have both gotten the same discipline and the same uh, benefits out of a, a military training that, uh, that, that that one another might. So, yeah, look, to, to come full circle to your question, no, I think the, the to force every doctor into mandatory military service would, would be a, a waste of, of a lot of their time where they could be developing specialist medical skill sets that we, we need in the community, you know. Uh, but for the few that self-select to go into that and love it, uh, myself being one of those, you know, it's it's brilliant, but it does come at the the trade off of de-skilling in a lot of areas that you then need to reskill in 
you, you fall well behind your civilian peers in terms of your your medical professional development and and so that's the trade off you know but the for me the that that came with the the opportunities that I had and and they balanced out nicely for me personally um just going i mean we do a lot of stuff on routine at swiss eight and routine's big and and in the app we uh we give people effectively it's a calendar and we say hey look build this routine as one of the big things get habit building and um i mean if at the moment they have a smorgasbord of uh programs mindfulness through the eight pillars that they can do whatever they want to do um but what we're sort of starting to see now is i i I'm super interested to see high performers and what their days are filled up like. Um, and, you know, we're going to start looking at, you know, a day in the life of. So what does your daily routine look like? You know, if you're, if you're firing and functioning and, and ticking things off, you know, how you would like to see it. It's fairly variable these days. I, I, I mix and Max, I've got a, a variety of different roles that I do at the moment. So I, I do, well, most recently, I've just come back, as we spoke earlier, from a few weeks uh, supporting the filming of the uh, SAS Australia. And so the routine went completely out the window there. That's that was a that's a really intensive process. There is so much that goes on behind the scenes there. And, and wherever the recruits go, I needed to go. And then after hours, there's there's uh, various tasks and functions and reporting duties. So, but I, I accept that my routine will go out the window. I try and pick up little bits and pieces and keep them going, but I try not to judge when it falls uh, out of whack. But coming back into quarantine has been a great opportunity for me to get back into a routine. And so this this last week where I've been in, in quarantine by myself, I've I've gotten back into my habits. And so that that looks like uh, getting up at a reasonable hour. So I, I was very uh, deliberate in in paying off my sleep debt when I had the opportunity because, I've you know, I'm in this uh, unbelievable uh, opportunity window here to sleep whenever I want, basically. So the first few nights I didn't set an alarm at all. And, and the first night I actually slept for near on 12 hours, which was unheard of uh, for me, but... But the, we, we accumulate this this sleep debt. Most of us are walking around sleep deprived, and and that's a, a real, really detrimental to all aspects of human performance. So I very deliberately, I knew I was accumulating a bunch of sleep debt on this uh, last three weeks. So I repaid that over a few days, and and now I've started to get back into my habit. But the the routine that I have at the moment, I I um I'll get up, I'll, I'll do some mindfulness meditation, and uh, so I use a at the moment, a thing called a Muse device, which is a neurofeedback device, a headband that reads your brainwaves and hooks up to an app and gives you real-time feedback. And so I, I really like that thing. So uh, I'll, I'll do 15, 20 minutes of mindfulness meditation using that. And then I'll roll straight into, I've got a little yoga app called uh, Down Dog. And so I roll into 20, 30 minutes of, of yoga. Um I'm a bit buckled at the moment. I've got a, a, a ruptured spinal disc and a, about six weeks ago, I fractured a few ribs and broke my arm skateboarding. So I've sort of, uh, my, my PT regime has, has been reduced to, uh, well, now rehab and, and yoga pretty much is, uh, is the, the limit of it until this arm gets full function back. But um, so a bit of yoga. And then I'll, I'll set out my, my day. I've always, at any given time, I, I, I like to have a, a list of things that I need to do. So these tick boxes and I'll, I'll set out my day. I'll structure it. But for this hour, I'm going to focus on this. For this hour, I'm going to focus on that. A uh, little bit of time in the sun each day if it's out. So 10 to 15 minutes, just getting a bit of sunlight on my uh, on my body. And and yes, I mean, I've been getting back into a ketotic diet. Uh, the, the keto went out the window with the the food was just way too good on um, the SAS Australia set to to not eat it. It seemed disrespectful, but uh, amazingly catered for. So so uh, blew out the keto there and accepted that'd be the case. But got got back into keto in the in the last week and and so yeah, just rolling through the the keto, having just structured stuff that I need to tick off uh, each day. And and so that's that's the process. Cold water is a, a big feature. So um, I love to have an ice bath every week. Uh, here I, I can't get out to get my ice, so I've just been blasting myself each water, uh, morning after yoga with with a cold water, so just a cold shower, and so I have a blast of that. 
and that's my morning routine and and then I, I start the day from there but but have some set uh, non-negotiables that that I must do to set me up for the day and then have some key tasks for that day uh, and so I'll tick them off if, if I get anything else done that's a bonus if, if things don't get done that's not the end of the world I roll them over to the next day the end of the day I um, well while I'm in ISO I'm, I'm connecting with my family you know that's some time to make a point of FaceTiming my, my little team and talking to the kids and, and my wife and and then there'll be a bit of reflection bit of journaling and uh, and a bit of bit of gratitude uh, journaling at the end of every given day so that's that's a an ideal day and it's one that I'm able to achieve when I'm in ISO here. Uh, but as I said, sometimes I, I don't get any of that done. Sometimes I only get components of that done. But I always try and fall back into that routine at every available opportunity. Man, that is a solid bloody daily routine. I've got one final question before Max wraps us up. This is this is a, a quick one just to help me get some confirmation bias for a debate that I've been having. <laughs> What's your blood time? Are you happy to put that on the podcast? Yes, a positive. Oh, you, you've just fucked <laughs> up theory. Don't worry about it. We'll cut that bit out of the end. <laughs> I couldn't lie to you, but there's probably, we had, probably so just, dozens of photos of me rolling around with a with a blood type patch on my arm from uh, being in uniform. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we had we did a podcast with a couple of um, dietitians last week, and they are switched like they are all over dietetics. And I tried to to pitch them the theory of blood type dieting and how. A, a blood types are designed to be vegans. B is designed to be kind of a mixed paleo base and, and O is a, a meat dominant that, that tends to correlate better with a, a ketogenic high fat bit of protein kind of diet. So being someone who's an advocate for keto dieting, I was like, please, please be O positive or please be an O blood type. But my theory is out the window, mate. So I'll just I don't think talking. that you, I, I could just be an outlier. I'm not sure. It's yeah, it's easy to scratch out those ones that don't fit your bell curve. But um, yeah, I, and and that said, I've <laughs> never I've never given a vegan diet a good nudge. Maybe I'd feel like a million bucks on that. But um, yeah, at the moment the the keto seems to to work for me. So yeah, might might have shot your theory in the ass there. Mate, um, I really want to say thanks for coming on. Um, before we go, I just want to let everyone know that's listening, go if you haven't and, and give you a chance to plug it. But I really got a lot out of the Resilient Shield and uh, hearing guys of your calibre, and I know you guys are all humble, but guys of your calibre experiencing the thing, things you experience gives people that opportunity to know it's okay and that I can grow and move forward through this stuff. So I think that that resilient shield and and even um, the average seventy kilo dickhead mate, they are brilliant. Um, I listen to them on Audible, uh, and I recommend everyone go and go and watch them. But or listen to them, uh, mate. Where can they find more stuff outside of what I've just spruced? So we've got a, a website, resilientshield.com, where we've got links to things like the, the Resilient Shield book. We've also got a resilient survey that I spoke about, so you can hop on and do that. And that gives you a, a resilient score, uh, and it's, it's underpinned by, by the validated um, uh, survey, survey components that I spoke of, the, the tools that we use to assess the different layers of the Resilient Shield. But the, the more... A useful part of that survey, in my opinion, is that it gives you individual layer scores. And so you can see where your relative strengths are, where your areas for improvement might be. And uh, I think that's quite a useful tool. The And we've got some blog articles there as well that just elaborate a little bit on on some of the stuff in the Resilient Shield. And for, for me personally, uh, Instagram is probably where I'm most active, Instagram or LinkedIn. Just Dan Pronk on either of those is is where I make a, a little bit of noise. Mate, thanks very much. Like I said, uh, guys, if you're listening, go and get it. Have a listen. Um, and thanks for coming on, mate. Uh, we'll have to get you back on as as things sort of happen down the track. And um, if you get any mad scoops on SES Australia, you know where to <laughs> non-contractually binding, uh, let us know. No, that's awesome. Look, I, I really appreciate your time. It's uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to to come on the podcast, and I really appreciate what what you guys and your movement are doing for the veteran community. I think it's huge, and I think it's saving lives. And keep up the good work. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Thanks. Cheers, mate. Uh